Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we come before your holy throne at this very solemn time of the earth's history where everything, Lord, seems to be falling apart everywhere. And you are the only solid rock, Lord, upon which we can stand firmly. But there are many forces trying to separate us from you, Lord. I am pleading now that as we study and as we look at the work of preparation to be done, that you may speak to us directly, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. Please, Heavenly Father, I am begging in the name of Jesus Christ that you may put your words in my mouth. Uh, I am a child, Lord, and from my mouth there is nothing that can come out that can save. I am just pleading in a special way that you may speak, Lord. As you open your Bible and as you open, Lord, quotations from the pen of inspiration, may sin lose its power. May your Son, Jesus Christ, be revealed clearer and clearer, Lord. And may your love, Heavenly Father, with, with its life-transforming power, be clearly seen. Please, King of the whole universe, help us. We need help and we need it now. Help us now as we look at this work of preparation that is so, so important and that has been so neglected. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, Amen. Uh, greeting saints in the wonderful name of Jesus Christ, Amen. So we are looking at a very, very important aspect uh, in this wonderful work of uh, preparation. Uh, now you'll remember when you read in your Bibles in the book of Revelation chapter 14. Uh, in verse 14, you see the second coming of Jesus where the Son of Man is seen sitting in the clouds of heaven and having a sickle in his hand ready to reap. So that is representing the second coming of Jesus. Now, the, 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 the message that immediately precedes the second coming of Jesus, it is the third angel's message. Now, that is the message that we are looking at today. Now, in the third angel's message, you have two divisions. Uh, first of all, it is the warning. Warning against receiving the mark of the beast and worshipping the image of the beast and worshipping the beast himself. Are you with me? That's, so, that's the warning. And that is the crisis that we are warned against that is soon to break upon the world. And we are told that it's going to take many people as an overwhelming surprise. So we are warned, saints, that there is a crisis coming. There is a crisis coming. But also we are given, we are given a work of preparation for the crisis. So that's the second division. So the third angel's message is divided into two parts, the warning and the preparation. So verse 9 to verse 11 is the warning, and then verse 12 is the, it's the preparation. We need to always understand that. Now, we are looking at the preparation. Both the warning and the preparation are important. Uh, today we are looking at the preparation. And saints, you know we have been studying this message now for quite some time. Uh, and I will say this. The aspect, the branch of the work of preparation that we are going to be looking at today, saints, it's one of the, the branches or aspects of the work of preparation that is greatly, greatly neglected. And I can tell you the truth, saints, if, if ever we neglect this and we don't prepare uh, according to what we are going to be studying now today, we might know all the events. And I can tell you there is no amount of knowledge of the events, saints, that we can have that will spare us from falling in the crisis if ever we don't understand what we are going to be studying today. And we might even be staying in the country, that's part of preparation, are you with me? But we can even be staying in the country if we don't, yeah, if we don't understand and we don't apply what we are going to be learning today, saints, I don't think that we can make it in the crisis, truly. This is a very important but neglected aspect of the work of preparation. And since all of these things are important, by the way, the knowledge of the events very, very important. Very, very important. Like Jesus himself, he teaches that we are to watch for the events. In Matthew 24, in verse 32 and 33, he says, uh, Now learn a parable of the word now, of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things come to pass, know that it is near even at the doors. Are you with me? So Jesus says that how we can know 
that is coming is near is when we see certain things coming to pass, seeing the events. Are you with me? And we cannot see the events if we are not watching for them. So the watching of the events is very important, saints. Like this is so repeated, so much repeated in scripture. Also in First Chronicles 12 verse 32, we are told that the sons of Issachar, they had a peculiar wisdom that they received. And that wisdom was to know what Israel ought to do. But the same verse tells us that the reason why that they knew what Israel ought to do is because they had an understanding of the times. Are you with me? So God through the Bible is telling us that it is important to know the events. So I'm not so, so I'm not saying it's not important. It's very, very important. In fact, let me tell you something, another quotation. Uh, in Testimonies to Ministers and Gospel Workers, page 118, it says, If our people were half awake, if they realized the nearness of the events portrayed in the Revelation, a reformation would be wrought and many more would believe our message. Are you with me? So we are told that if our people were half awake, if they realized the events, the nearness of the events portrayed in the Revelation, a reformation would be wrought. So these events are very important things. Also, country living, very important. You know that country living is important. There is no way that you can be ready for the crisis without country living. Just as there is no way that Noah could have been ready for the storm without having built an ark. There is no way. There is no way. He could have been praying all the 120 years. But if he was not building the ark, he was going to, to, to sink. God would have raised up someone else, I suppose, to build the ark. So, saints... We need country living as well. So we need all of these types of preparation. But this preparation that we are looking at, I would say it is it is part of righteousness by faith. Uh, but I just want to go deep into something else. You know, something else that we don't really often spend a time looking at. Come with me to the book of Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Notice saints. Uh, verse 9 Verse 9 says Then shall they deliver you up To be afflicted and shall kill you And ye shall be hated of all nations For my name's sake What is that event? When we are delivered up To be afflicted To be persecuted And we shall be killed And we are hated by all nations What is that event? Saints, that is the National Sunday Law or even a global Sunday law, because we're told that we are now hated by all nations. Hmm? And I just want us to see, saints, what comes during the crisis, or immediately as the Sunday law is enacted, there is something that happens. Verse 10 tells us, it says, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. Do you hear that? So we're told that, and during this crisis, not only are we going to be prevented from buying and selling, not only are we going to be cut out from every earthly support, as we are told in the book Deserve Ages, page 121. Buying and selling, we are told in Revelation 13, verse 17. So those are not the only things that are going to be happening, that are going to be causing people to, to lose heart, to lose courage, and to fall. And not only are we, going to be, are we going to be imprisoned and persecuted and even killed, but we are told that another thing that is going to be happening is that many people are going to be offended. The word therefore offended means to, to fall away, to fall basically. Are you with me? To fall, to fall. So we are told that during the National Sunday Law, many people are going to be falling. And this in itself, saints, is a great, great crisis. You might be asking, how can that? How is that a crisis? People falling, people fall all the time. Well, let me say this. I'm going to I'm going to to share two quotations with you that show that during the National Sunday Law, there is going to be the biggest, the worst shaking that we have ever seen. When you read in Selected Messages, Book Three, Page Three Eighty Five, speaking of the National Sunday Law, it says. And this great issue so near at hand will weed out those whom God has not appointed and he will have a pure, true, sanctified ministry prepared for the latter reign. Are you with me? So we are told that this issue so near at hand, the Sunday law saints, 
is going to be the issue that weeds out everyone that was not appointed by God. And God is going to have a, a pure, true, sanctified ministry prepared for the latter reign. Also, we are told in, in, in last day events, page 180, the quotation, the quotation says, The church may appear as though about to fall. Are you with me? But it does not fall. It remains while the sinners in Zion are sifted out. The chaff separated from the precious wheat. Are you with me? And then we're told, this is a terrible ordeal. But nevertheless, it must take place. So we're told that saints, during the Sunday law, the chaff is going to be separated from the what now? From the wheat. Are you with me? This is the crisis that is going to do the final separation. And here, saints, we are going to see the worst falling away that we have ever seen in the history of this church, saints. People of every class. Now, this is where it really gets interesting. And this is where our study is going. Do you know that the people are going to be falling away, saints? It's not only the, the careless. The irreligious, uh, the world loving, the unconsecrated. Mm -mm. It's not only those saints. No, no, no. Don't be confused. Notice this quotation. Notice this quotation, saints, what it says. Great Controversy, page 608, says, As the storm approaches, a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message, but have not been sanctified through obedience to the truth, Abandon their position and join the ranks of the opposition. Are you with me? So we see here that a large class who have professed faith in the third angel's message. Do you know that as we speak now in our church, there are, there are some people who don't even know that there is a third angel's message. Here it's speaking about people who not only know, but who profess to believe it. Not only people who profess to believe it, but people whom with our own eyes, since we have seen, actually putting in practice some of these things that we are studying as the work of preparation, we are told that a large class of those, we are told that they are going to abandon their position and join the ranks of the enemy. Now, notice it continues, continues. It says, men of talent and pleasing address, hmm? who once rejoiced in the truth, employ their powers to deceive and mislead souls. They become the most bitter enemies of their former brethren. Do you hear the saints? We're told that these are men of talent and of pleasing address. Hmm? And men who once not only heard the truth, but you could see that as they hear it, they are rejoicing in the truth. Like speaking the truth with joy. Saints, just think about that. As the Sunday law breaks and you are under pressure because of many of the things that are going to... The Sunday law says this crisis is not going to be a joke. There is going to be a lot of pressure. There is going... Like there is just going to be a lot of things that are enough to cause the bravest soul to faint. And saints, on top of these things, these external pressures that are happening, you are also now faced with the discouragement. Of seeing someone who once taught you the truth. Denying the truth which they once taught. Imagine what effects that will have upon you. As you see the very person from whom you have learned the truth. The person that you have, you have learned to look up to so to speak. And now the same eloquence with which they were actually embracing and proclaiming the truth. That same eloquence is employed. To refute the truth, you listen to them, maybe appearing on television or wherever it may be, on YouTube, wherever it may be, giving eloquent, almost unanswerable reasons why they believe that they made a mistake in previously proclaiming the truth. They give reason after reason and saints with a pressure that already has mounted upon your shoulders. With all the things that are happening, the, the no buy, no sell. And you find that maybe you, 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 you know you're in great want of this or that. And on top of that, the pressure of seeing someone 
of that class falling and leaving the truth. Imagine seeing them joining the world in mocking the commandments of God, joining the world in sin, seeing someone who used to, whose, mark, whose life used to be marked with integrity. And now you see that maybe they divorce their wives, they're cheating on their wives, they're doing this and they're doing that. Are you with me? Saints, it is going to be a terrible ordeal. It is going to be a terrible ordeal. Do you know that the same thing that I'm mentioning in Matthew 24, it's also mentioned that many people are actually going to fall not because of these, uh, you know, the, the no buy, the no sell, uh, the, the want of food and clothing, as we're told in, in Prophets and Kings, page 184, that many for want of food and clothing will join the ranks of the enemy in transgressing the commandments of God. But in Matthew 24, we're told that that's not the only reason why people are going to be falling. Notice, notice, saints. Notice this, uh, in verse 12, same crisis, crisis in verse 9, people are falling in, in, in verse 10. Now notice what we are told, and then the same people who fall in verse 11, we are told that they are going to be deceiving many. As they fall away, then they become false prophets, false mouthpieces, because a prophet is a mouthpiece of heaven, a mouthpiece of God. Now, as they fall away, they, began, they begin to become false prophets. Are you with me? And they shall deceive many. Now, notice also verse 12. It says, And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Are you with me? We are told that many people are going to wax cold or fall away because iniquity is abounding. They see iniquity everywhere in the highest classes of believers. They see iniquity. Saints, notice this quotation. You know, the shaking is going to be terrible. It is going to surprise many and many if we don't get what we are studying today. We don't prepare. We don't prepare for this shaking that is coming. And our minds are not prepared uh, how to deal with the faults and the falls of those who, whom we trust or those who have taught us the truth, we are going to be served away. Going to be served away, saints. Notice, notice, uh, I'm reading in volume 5 of the testimonies, page 81. It says, the time is not far distant when the test will come to every soul. The mark of the beast will be urged upon us. It says, those who have step by step yielded to worldly demands and confirm, conformed to worldly customs will not find it a hard matter to yield to the powers that be rather than subject themselves to derision, insult, threatened imprisonment, and death. We are told now, in this time, the gold will be separated from what? From the dross in the church. So again, we are told there's, there's a separation. So we find this in Matthew 24 verse 10. We find this in last day events, page 180. We find this in selected messages. Book 3, page 385. Now we're finding it in Testimonies of the Church, volume 5, page 81. So this is settled. At the Sunday law, we are going to find the worst shaking ever. And now we're told things that in this time, notice. It says, in this time, the gold will be separated from the dross in the church. Then it says, many a star that we have admired for its brilliancy will then go out in darkness. Chaff, like a cloud, will be borne away on the wind, even from places where we see only floors of rich wheat. Do you hear that saying? Now, let me explain. In this, uh, I'll say, analogy of the chaff and the wheat, the chaff is the useless, the unwanted stuff that during the sifting, that is what is sh shaken away or blown away by the wind. And the wheat is what is of value. So the wheat here in this analogy would represent those who are pure and holy in heart. Are you with me? But we are told now, chaff like a cloud will be borne away on the wind, even from places where we see only flaws of rich wheat. Are you with me? We are told that Many a star that we have admired for its brilliancy will fade in the darkness. Saints, 
So these are not believers uh, of a normal category. These are people to whom we have looked up. A star admired for its brilliancy. Are you with me, saints? People that we have, we have trusted and people who, whom many people who have looked to for counsel, for guidance, and also as an example in the present truth. We are told that during this time of shaking, even such people we might find being shaken away, saints. And I ask you again, imagine the impact that will have upon your own heart, saints. It's going to be devastating. It's going to be devastating. And if you don't think so, let me just show an example in the Bible where such a thing has occurred. Well, not exactly the same, but very similar. Where someone who is a teacher of the saints makes a mistake. And notice, saints, the people that are actually swayed and make the, the same mistake with him. Let's go to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians, the second chapter. I tell you, saints, you can be in the country. You, you could have known all the events. But it can be that the same people who are telling about country living can be that the same people that were telling you about the events. You find that now they are swept away. What do you do? Discouraged. And many pressures again, I say, mounting up upon your shoulders. Many, many pressures. And it, it just seems as if you have believed a lie because the people, one by one, they show how that this message is a lie. This message is a lie. And you are, hey, saints, the... I will tell you, the experience is going to be overwhelming and the discouragement is going to be very great. And unless we are prepared by such things as we are going to be looking at today, yeah, saints, we are truly going to be swept away. Because I believe that this study is very, very important. Notice Galatians chapter 2. And one of the reasons why saints is very important is because many of us, we have not, we have not yet seen uh, how dangerous and how perilous it is to place our confidence in man. And this study, basically, I will say, what we are going to see here is the danger of placing our confidence in man. And we are going to see, saints, why is it that God permits certain men to fall even before the crisis? We are going to see that why is it also that God permits even us to fall? There is something that God is doing which is for our own good. And were it not because of these falls and these offenses, we would not make it in the great test and final test. Are you with me? Okay, notice now. Galatians 2. I'll begin in verse 11. It says, But when Peter was come to Antioch, now Antioch was a place of the Gentiles. Says, but this is Paul speaking. But when Peter was come to Antioch, I would stood him to the face because he was to be blamed. For before that Satan came from James, he did eat with the Gentiles. But when they were come, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing them which were of the circumcision. And the other Jews dissembled likewise with him, in so much that Barnabas also was carried away with their dissimulation. Mm, mm, mm. Let me just pause here. Saints, we are told that this is what was happening. The saints are in Antioch. Paul is in Antioch. Uh, Barnabas is in Antioch. There are some Jews also in Antioch. Barnabas was also a Jew. Paul was a Jew. But the the many the greater the greater majority of the believers in Antioch were Gentiles. And Paul and Barnabas, knowing the truth of the gospel, that you know it chooses no race uh, and no class. Everyone is saved by the same blood. Everyone is equal at the feet of the cross. They knew that I would just, you know, we partake with the Gentiles. We, we, we even sleep in their homes. We do like, we are just like Gentiles. There is no Jew nor Gentile in Christ Jesus. That's what they knew. So they partook. And, and Peter came and he partook of the same spirit, you know. That was the spirit of the gospel. And he was eating with the Gentiles. You know, I can imagine just hugging some of them, holding them, speaking nicely, all of these things. And then some people, some Jews, street Jews came from Jerusalem. And were told that when Peter saw them, Peter separated himself from the Gentiles. 
And Paul saw this. And we are told that when Peter made this mistake, it was a mistake as you see as you read the following verses. When Peter made this mistake, we are told that all the other Jews that were with him, they followed in the same mistake. Are you with me? Why did they follow in his mistake? Well, it's because Peter was the highest teacher of the gospel at the time. Are you with me? He was an apostle. That was the highest position in the church. And he had been in person with Jesus Christ. His authority saying it was amazing. It was amazing, truly. And God had done so many miracles through Peter. Like, pe people really, really respected Peter. God had spoken so powerfully through Peter. Peter would speak and 3,000 would be converted in a day. Are you with me? So many things God had done through Peter. Barnabas as well, I believe, was converted through the ministration of Peter. And we're told here that not only the other Jews were taken by this mistake of Peter, but even Barnabas himself, we're told, was taken by this dissimulation. Are you with me, saints? And if Barnabas could be taken, saints, don't think that you also cannot be taken by a mistake of someone who has been your teacher. Are you with me? Let me just say, share something about Barnabas. Barnabas Saints was not a, a well-loving Christian. His consecration and his zeal was very, very great. In fact, when you read in Acts chapter 4, I believe it's in verse 37, that's where you find that Barnabas, he had land and he sold his land and we're told that he brought all the money to the apostles' feet. Can you imagine that? Everything that he had gave it to the progress of the gospel. And not only that, but when there was work going on in Antioch, you find this in Acts chapter 11, when there was work going on in Antioch, saints, and the church wanted to send someone who was just going to go and examine that work and oversee that work, do you know who they chose? They chose Barnabas. They trusted his judgment. Are you with me? That is how consecrated he was. That is how much he was filled of the Holy Spirit. And we are told in Acts chapter 11, verse 23 and 24, that when, when Barnabas arrives there, he encouraged the saints to cleave unto the Lord. Are you with me? And in verse 24, we are told that as, as a result of his ministration, many more other believers were added to the faith. Can you see that Barnabas was no normal person? He was a minister of the Lord himself. Do you know when, when workers had to be chosen for the special task of taking the gospel to the Gentiles, Barnabas and Paul were mentioned by name by God. Are you with me? Imagine God mentioning your name by name. Mentioning you by, by name. When you read in Acts chapter 13 in verse 2, you find that by the Holy Spirit, God said, separate me, Paul and Barnabas, for the work that I have called them to. Are you with me? So do you see that this is a man that even heaven recognizes as a consecrated man? And when you read in Acts chapter 15 in verse 26, we are told that Barnabas was a man who hazarded his life for the Lord's sake. Are you with me, saints? So I'm just showing you like very, very plainly from inspiration that Barnabas was a man of deep consecration. Of very deep consecration. Yet this man, we are told that when he saw one of his teachers, Peter, doing something which was clearly a mistake as we would see when you continue the verses, he was also led away with the dissimulation saints. So if if such a man as Barnabas can be led away, what makes you think that you won't fall away in this great, great and very terrible shaking sense that I, I, I tremble will be taking place? We were told that many a star that we have admired for its brilliancy will then go out in darkness. We are told that we are going to see chaff like the cloud being born by the wind from floors where we had only descend rich wheat. Are you with me? Do you know what it means when we, when we see only rich wheat? Like when we're looking at a particular place or at particular individuals, we, can just, we only see purity, consecration. Yet saints are told that in very many of such flaws, 
chaff is going to be blown away. And we'll be surprised, how can that be chaff? Not only will we be surprised, but we will be greatly discouraged. And we might even be swept away. Even as we see people, saints like Barnabas, being taken by the mistake of Peter. And let me tell you something. Uh, many of us, if we had been there in those days, when Peter and the other Jews and Barnabas had made this mistake, and it came to a point in time, maybe they are doing a, a tent meeting or a crusade, whatever it be. And Peter's turn to speak comes up and you know, you're invited to go there and you ask who is speaking. And then you're told, well, uh, it's, it's Peter who's going to be taking this evening service to this evening. And then tomorrow, uh, up until Friday, it's Peter. You probably, many of us would say, I please, no, that not that fellow. Mm -mm. Please call me. Please call me when it's Paul speaking. Are you with me? Then I told that no, Paul is only beginning next week after Peter Barnabas is taking the services. No, 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 not that now Barnabas is a weakling. Many of us would have such sentiments and would miss out on the benefit that God has actually implanted in some of the messages that these brethren will be giving. Because after this, after this event, saints, Peter and Barnabas himself. They repented from this mistake and God continued to use them in, a, in a, a very, very mighty way. In a very extraordinary way, they still continued. And until the point where Peter sealed his faith with his own blood. Hmm? Yet many of us would have been discouraged by this and said, no more with Peter, no more with Barnabas. Can you imagine the effect that it might have had saints? Even on those Gentiles that they were sitting with when Peter and Barnabas are moving away. Like, just imagine it like this. Let's say you have a minister, uh, let's say maybe an African, just like as I am, and there's a minister who's of maybe another color, let's say maybe he's, he, he's a white minister or so forth. And then when other people maybe of his same race they come, he then begins to separate from you Africans and he, it's like he doesn't. You can imagine how painful that would be, like that racism. It's amazing, since the pain that you'd feel. And I can just imagine that after that incident, many believers in Antioch were greatly, greatly discouraged. Many were greatly, greatly discouraged. Many. And many of them, they wanted nothing to do with Peter or Barnabas. Only when Paul is speaking, then call me. Many of them would go a week later to the crusades when Paul is speaking. But do you know, saints, but do you know that a short while after this incident, uh, something happened between Paul and Barnabas that might have made you to give up even on Paul himself. There was a time, this you find in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 15, uh, and the verse is verse 39. When, when Paul and Barnabas came from Jerusalem, uh, they were traveling with Silas. And as they arrived in Antioch, Mark was also there. Now Mark had been with them in their previous missionary journey, but Mark did not finish the journey because Mark was afraid of the dangers that attended the missionary trips and the missionary tours. So he turned away. So Paul was... You know, he was, he was upset at this, the waste of, you know, because it wasn't free to travel. They had to pay, there's food and all of these things. And now for someone to turn away, like it was, yeah, Paul was just really troubled by this. So when they meet Mark again now in Antioch, Barnabas says, I let's take Mark again in, in these trips. And Mark wants to go as well. Paul says, we can't take this fellow. This fellow cannot go. Mm-mm. And Barnabas says, no, let's take Mark. I'm ta no, man, let's take Mark. Paul says, we can't take... And we are told in Acts chapter 15, verse 39, that the contention was so sharp that Paul and Barnabas had to go separate ways. Can you imagine that? Oh, just imagine it with me, saints. These grand teachers of the gospel of unity and of love, imagine hearing them argue, just hearing them argue. Imagine them now hearing them argue sharply 
we are told that the contention was sharp. So it was not like, you know, it wasn't just, yeah, you know, I think let's take this one. Oh, well, it's fine if you don't take, it's fine. You know, let, you know let's do it this way. Uh, we can just, so that we cover different ground. Let's, mm -mm. We are told that it was sharp, you know, go your way, I go my way. It was a sharp contention. You know, just even imagine this, like saying it causes me truly man to just tremble. Like, Paul, a man saint who had been endowed with the gift of healing people, even resurrecting the dead. Are you with me? Who had spoken so touchingly about the love of Jesus that it appeared as though his lips, his mouth was dipped in blood. Are you with me? That is how eloquently and touchingly he spoke of the love of Jesus. Like as he would speak of the love of Christ, people's hearts would melt. Are you with me? Now imagine such a person arguing. And arguing sharply. Many of us would have been offended. Say, I'm done with this issue of the gospel. I didn't expect this here. To, fi to find such a thing from these people. I am done. It's fine. The gospel... Yeah, I don't know, but this man, if they can argue like this, if Paul can be so unforgiving towards Mark, as we might see it maybe with our own human eyes. And that's the thing, saints, that we don't understand. That's the thing that we don't understand. That is exactly what God is going to show us here. That the ministers of the gospel, they are just but men. They are just but men, capable also of faults and mistakes. They are not the pattern man. Mm -mm. Jesus is the only pattern saint that we can safely look to. Jesus is the only pattern. These are just but man. Jesus is the only pattern that we can safely look up to. These men repented. And many people who might have been offended as they heard maybe this contention. Because afterwards, Paul received Mark. And they had, you know, a wonderful... Fellowship, when you, when you read Paul's letter to Timothy, he writes about how that Mark has been so helpful to him. Are you with me? Now, if you'd have held on to that mistake, you'd have endangered your own soul. Because nowhere does it say in the Bible that ministers of the gospel will not make mistakes. Are you with me, saints? But how you'll know that this is a true minister is that as they make the mistakes, they repent. They repent. They repent. You might not be there maybe to see the repentance, but you will see the fruit of the repentance. Saints. So we need to understand that ministers of the gospel, they are just but men. They are not the pattern. Jesus is the pattern. They are not the cornerstone. Are you with me? But they are just but a stepping stone to lead you to the cornerstone. Are you with me? Who is Jesus? Now many of us, we take the ministers and we pattern our lives after them and they become the cornerstone and that is a dangerous thing. The Bible says, Cursed be the man that trusts in man and makes flesh his arm sins. Let me show you a quotation that plainly shows us the danger of patterning our lives in accordance to the lives of these men. I'm reading now from volume 5 of the Testimonies. Page 214. This thing about the ceiling, it speaks about teachers, people who have taught the present truth with power, and many of them were told that they won't receive the seal. That's in page 213. Then it continues. It tells us the reasons why. It says, By their lack of devotion and piety, and their failure to reach a high religious standard, they make other souls contented with their position mm. says man of finite judgment can not see that in patterning after these men these teachers of the present truth who have so often opened to them the treasures of god's word they will surely endanger their souls jesus is the only true pattern oh let me repeat saints those red words says man of finite judgment cannot see that in patterning after these men who have so often opened to them the treasures of God's word, they will surely endanger their souls. Jesus is the only true pattern. Do you hear that? It says, everyone 
must now search the Bible for himself upon his knees before God with the humble, teachable heart of a child if he would know what the Lord requires of him. So saints, we are told, we are told that when we pattern our lives, if you pattern now, you're watching the study, if you pattern your life after me, inspiration doesn't say that you might be endangering your soul. It says you are surely, do you see these red words? Let me show them again. Men of finite judgment cannot see that in patterning after these men who have so often opened to them the treasures of God's word, they will surely, not might, they will surely endanger their souls. Patterning your life after any man except the man of Calvary is a sure recipe for disaster. The only solution, saints, is found in the book of Isaiah chapter 2, verse 22. Seize from man whose breath is in his nostrils. Seize from man. Seize from man. Even if they have opened the, the treasures of God's word, seize from man. Are you with me? These men, saints, have been ordained by God not to be a what now? A cornerstone, but a stepping stone to lead others to the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. I want no man or woman patterning their lives after me or after another, a anyone. I mean, there are so, so many of my friends who are in the ministry and I suppose that uh, there are also many people who look up to them as well, but saints are told there is a danger. You are going to be greatly disappointed. Greatly disappointed. Greatly disappointed if you do so. Now, I'm not saying that my friends or even myself, we are going to, at the shaking, we are going to give up the truth. Mm -mm. But I'm just saying what inspiration is saying. Jesus is the only cornerstone. Jesus is the only anchor. Don't anchor your faith in man. Anchor your faith in the man of Calvary. Look at my hands. There is nothing. There is no scar in these hands. Jesus, even as we speak, has scars in his hands for you. Look at my forehead. There are no scars. There is nothing. But as you speak, Jesus has scars in his forehead, which he has taken for you and me, saints. So please, saints, let us look to Jesus. The position of being the pattern man in our lives, the position of being our example, the position of being our chief counselor, Jesus has purchased with his own blood. Hmm? Let us not place man in that position, even if it is the president of the general conference. You know, do you know that the reason why many people made a mistake in our church, many, many people in our church, They've made a mistake during this, uh, this pandemic, this, this crisis of the COVID, you know, this, yeah. The reason why many people make, made a mistake and they even took this jab, saints, it is because they have been trained to trust in man and not to ask for themselves, what is the Lord saying? What does the word of God say? Are you with me? Do you know that when the churches were closed, I prayed and said, Lord, what do you say when churches are closing? And God led me to, to, to scriptures, to quotations. And I remember I even did a study online showing the saints that this is what God has shown me. I don't think that we're supposed to be closing. If ever, maybe the church is afraid, at least let's gather in homes. Oh, I remember there was a response even from one pastor who said that I'm mad. In, let, let, let me, I'm, just, I'm just putting it straight. He didn't say it exactly those words. Responded says that... Uh, yeah, you are crazy. And I just left it at that. I said, it's fine. It might be crazy. But I'm just going with what has been shown to me. And that is the experience that we need, saints. We need to get on our knees. Search the scriptures for ourselves. Not take man as our counselor. Are you with me? I hope that is plain, saints. Now, you know, I'm going to read a verse that shows us uh, what is the solution? What is the solution? How can we be prepared for this great falling away? That when these men who have so often opened the treasures of God's word to the multitudes, when they fall away, uh, you don't fall away with them. Are you with me? 
Now God, yeah, God is God has a way, saints. God has a way all the time. All the time, God has a way. Because I mean, we are bought with blood, and God wants us to make it through the crisis, saints. Because God has purchased us at an infinite cost. So don't you don't even begin to think that God has not given us a way of overcoming such uh, discouraging situations. Because I can tell you, it's really discouraging when someone who was really used by God when they fall away. It really, really is discouraging. Uh, let's go to, to Matthew 18. What is the reason for these trials? Now, I don't know if I'm going to communicate this very clearly, but I'll try. We have seen that in the crisis that we are heading to, what's going to hap happen and what's going to cause many people to fall is not just the no buy, no sells. Many people might be prepared for that. They might be farming, doing that, all, all of these things. They might be in the country. Uh, but I told also that many people, as iniquity abounds, as they see many brethren falling away, many also are going to wax cold, meaning they're going to fall away. Are you with me? And then we, and we saw also the example where Peter made a, 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 you know, a simple mistake. And many brethren went with that mistake. So we see, saints, uh, the weakness of the human nature. How that we are so prone to following uh, man, especially if it is men uh, who have opened to us the treasures of God's word, who have taught us. I, I can just imagine why Barnabas was taken probably by this dissimulation of Peter. I mean, Peter had spoken with such great power at Pentecost. It was amazing. And to imagine that Peter is in error was just like, ah, I know it cannot be. If Peter is moving, let me move. Hmm. Great mistake. Now we've seen that. Now what we're about to see, saints, is, the, is God's response uh, to this trial which he sees would cause many people to fall. And God's response to this trial is so, so simple, saints. But I... I Around ish, yeah, like like words are failing me. How to just reveal this? Let's just read the verse and see. Verse seven it says, "Who unto the world because of offenses? For it must needs be that offenses come. But who to that man by whom the offense cometh?" Let's pause here. We are told that offenses are going to come to the world. Are you with me? And it says, woe unto the world because of the offenses. It also says that woe unto the, unto the person through whom the offenses come. Uh, now the word offenses there, it means, you know, things that cause people to fall. And, you know, the, the idea is that you are walking in the road somewhere and then someone puts some logs or some timber and as you are walking and the grass is maybe high, you don't see the timber. And as you're walking, you trip and you fall. Are you with me? Now, the question, whose fault was it that you fell? Well, uh, many people's answer would be, it's that fellow's fault. Why did he leave that timber there? It might have been by mistake or it might, it might have been intentionally. We don't know that he left the timber there. Why was he so careless, you might ask, to leave the timber there? Or why was he so cruel to leave the timber there? So it's his fault. But another believer whom the Holy Spirit is truly molding might say, it's my fault. I should have seen the timber. I should have seen the timber. I should have walked over the timber. So I wasn't looking. I was also walking carelessly, depending on the carefulness of others that I, you know, if others are careful, there will be no timbers on this place. But can't depend on others. Can't depend on others. Now the verse says, Who unto the world because of offenses? And then the part that I want us to focus on, it says, it says, it says in verse, verse 7, it says, For it must needs be that offenses come. Are you with me? Now this is the part, saints, that you know you might really want to consider. We are told that it must needs be, it is necessary that offenses come. It is necessary that offenses come. 
Now, why is it necessary that offenses come? Like such offenses as the one that we have just been speaking about, where people who are leaders, teachers, they make mistakes, even like now, before the final shaking, before the Sunday law, just simple mistakes that some teachers might be making. Those are offenses, things that can really make people to fall. We are told that it must needs be that offenses come. But also I want you to notice now. It doesn't say it must needs be that you fall over those offenses. Are you with me? It says it must needs be that those timbers are placed on the way. But it doesn't say that it must needs be that you fall over the timber. Are you with me, saints? Now you might be asking, like, what in the world is that? Like, how can you say there is a need for offenses? How can there be a need for something that is causing people to fall? Well, I'm not saying that. Jesus is saying that it must needs be that offenses come. They must come. Why now? Notice the reason here, saints. I'm reading this quotation. And this is just an answer. God's answer to this problem, saints, truly. We are in trouble if we trust in man. Notice what God does. Ministry of Healing, page 486, paragraph 7, says, In his mercy and faithfulness, God often permits those in whom we place confidence to fail us in order that we may learn the folly of trusting in man and making flesh our arm. Do you hear that saying? Oh, we did not hear such a thing. You know, when I first read this, I would I, I memorize this quotation. I, I could not believe it. It says, in his mercy and what now? And faithfulness. God often permits those in whom we place confidence to fail us. Are you with me? We're told that this is God's mercy and faithfulness. Meaning, if God would not permit this, he would be unfaithful. He would be unmerciful. You ask, how is this mercy? When I have placed so much confidence in a particular teacher, in a particular brother, and then he fails me. How can that be merciful? How can that be God's faithfulness? Well, it is, it is in this way, saints. We are told that it is so that we may learn the folly, folly is foolishness, of trusting in man and making flesh our arm. Are you with me? So just before the crisis of the final shaking, where it's too late to learn lessons. Now you're writing the test. It's no more time for preparation or learning. You're writing the test. Well, so that before the crisis, God is going to do something. He is going to permit those in whom we have placed confidence to fail us. And this, this failure, it is actually for our good, for our benefit. How does it benefit us? The quotation says that we may learn the foolishness of trusting in man and making flesh our arm. Do you hear that, saints? So, basically how God, uh, I would say, prepares us not to fall uh, by the mistakes of others during the Sunday law crisis, uh, it is by showing us the mistakes of others now. So, God, God will permit us to see glimpses, probably not everything, probably glimpses of the misjudgments, the mistakes, uh, maybe the lack of, I, I don't know, sincerity or the lack of wisdom, uh, the lack of foresight, uh, the lack of consecration, you might see it as well, uh, of those in whom we have placed confidence. And the reason why he permits it, it is so that we may learn the foolishness of trusting in man and making flesh our arm. And when the crisis strikes, and men begin to fall all over. You have already learned that, yes, we ought not to trust in men. The lesson is deeply engraved in your, in your heart and in your mind that it is foolishness to trust in men. Notice now this verse saying the same thing, saints. Jesus says it must needs be that offenses come. Now, do you see why it must needs be, saints? In fact, even going further than the words that Jesus spoke here, in the book of Matthew, he speaks the same words here again through Ellen White. But now he speaks them more emphatically. He says, it is his mercy and faithfulness that causes him to permit these offenses to come. Do you hear that? Sure. Thank you, Jesus. 
Thank you so much for your mercy. Now let us notice something in 1 Corinthians. Paul repeats a similar thought. 1 Corinthians 4. Uh, you know, uh, this was when there was a crisis between... Uh, will I say it's a crisis? But there was just this thing that the believers had. Oh, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos. Notice what Paul says. Verse 6. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 6. And these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Are you with me? Paul says that these things that I am speaking to you using myself and Apollos as an example, I am speaking to you so that you may not think of men above what is written. Are you with me, saints? Paul knew that men have this tendency of thinking of other men far above than what is written in the word of God of, of, concerning men. Now, what is written concerning men, you might ask? Let me show you Isaiah 40. Come with me to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40. What is written concerning men? Some interesting verses concerning men. Isaiah 40, uh, I'll read in verse 6. It says, And the voice said, Cry, and he said, What shall I cry? Now, this is the part that I want us to see. It says, All flesh is grass. Hmm? How much now? It doesn't say all wicked people. It says, All people, they are grass. All flesh is grass. And all the goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. Are you with me? It says the grass withered, the flower faded. What's here? We are told that all flesh is what? Grass. And then we are told that even their goodliness, their faithfulness is like the flower of the field. And what characteristic are, are, are we given in these verses concerning the flower of the field? We are told that the grass withers and the flower fades. So the goodness or the, or the faithfulness of man can fade away, saints. A man can be faithful today and five years down the line is unfaithful. One year down the line is unfaithful. Are you with me? All flesh is grass. When you trust in man, you are trusting in grass. Something so weak. Something that withers. Are you with me? Then you are told in verse 7, uh, in verse 8 it says but the word of our God shall stand forever are you with me so the only thing that endures forever it is the word of God so when you make the word of God now who is the word someone say it saying someone say it as you're watching who is the word of God it is Jesus hmm? so the flesh is grass even their faithfulness the people's faithfulness is true they can be faithful it is as the flower of the field they can only remain fully steadfast and constantly steadfast as they are holding on to the word of God who is Christ himself. Are you with me? So when you hold on to man, you are holding on to grass. Holding on to grass. Now notice another one. Oh, since this one I love so, so much. Psalms 35. Mm -mm. Psalms 39 verse 5. It says, Verily every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Are you with me, saints? Let me repeat it for your hearing. It says, Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. So we are told in this verse that if I can place my trust in man while they are in their best state, not when they are in the state maybe of making mistakes or this and that, let me say I place my trust and confidence in them and pattern my life after them while they are in their best state walking with the Lord, we are told that I will be placing my trust in vanity. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Not some man. Every man. At which state now? Not his worst state. Not his mild state. At his best state. Altogether vanity. Cease from man whose breast whose breath is in his nostrils, says the Lord.
Jesus is the only one saints upon whom we can rely fully and safely. Let us take our helpless selves and cast them at the cross of Jesus and ask Jesus to bear our sins with his love and with his strength. He is the only one who is steadfast. And the more we look upon his love, the more steadfast we will be. Do you know that this crisis will need so much endurance, saints? And there is only one thing that I remember in the Bible which we are told endures anything. It's love. 1 Corinthians 13 says love endureth all things. But man doesn't endure all things. You might trust in a man, the man can fail you. I'm going to pass from this point. Let me give another reason, maybe last reason, because I see that the time is almost finished. Why it must needs be that offenses come. Why it must needs be that offenses come. Let me share with you uh, an example of someone for whom offenses were necessary so that he might receive help. Peter, do you remember Peter saints? One day before uh, the trial and crucifixion of Jesus, Jesus says to the disciples, you are all going to betray me. Peter, you are going to deny me. Peter says, Lord, you might be speaking about others, but not me. In fact, though all men may deny you, I, I will even go with you to death or to prison. Are you with me? Peter had much confidence in his own self. Now, let me ask, was Peter trying to deceive Jesus when he spoke those words or did he mean them? Peter meant those words. We're told in his of ages when he speaks about the story of Peter. He meant all of these words. But we're also told Peter did not know himself. He did not know himself. He did not know himself, how weak he was. He meant what he said, but he had no knowledge of himself. And for such a man with so much self-confidence, who does not know that there is a lot of selfishness still in his heart, for such a man, it must needs be that offenses come. And the reason why the offenses are necessary for such a man, it is so that as the offenses come, they reveal what was within, what was hidden, what he was not going to be able to see, except the offenses should reveal it. And when it is revealed, then it can be dealt with. Are you with me, saints? The offenses, they truly help us in revealing to us those faults, those defects of which we were previously unaware. And when they are revealed to us, then we can deal with them. Are you with me? You cannot deal with something that you don't see. You can't do that. But as they are revealed, then they are dealt with. And sometimes it can only take the offenses. It was not the purpose of Christ that Peter should fall during the trial and the temptation. Are you with me? But Peter, because he trusted himself and he did not ask Jesus for help, but instead he debated Jesus when Jesus told him that he's going to fall, he's going to deny Jesus. He debated with the Lord of glory, hmm? with the wisdom of the universe. He debated and said, no, Lord, you are mistaken. I won't do that. Can you imagine how much self-confidence that is when God is telling you that you're going to do this and you say, no, 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 I won't do that. Sure, saints. So you see this issue of self-confidence. That is just one of the faults that might be harbored in the heart that you might not see. And it might take an offense, a falling, to reveal it to us. So for such people, it must needs be. And you know how I know things that Peter was really helped by this offense of denying the Lord Jesus Christ? It's because Jesus says, says, this is what is going to happen. But when you are converted, strengthen your brethren. Are you with me? So after that fall, after that, that mistake, Peter was truly converted. He was no longer self-dependent and self-confident and, you know, trusting himself and uh, seeing himself as higher than his brethren. Because that was one of his faults. He saw himself as more holy and more faithful and more steadfast than all his brethren. He said, Lord, they might all deny you, not me. I'm not like the others. Are you with me? But when he fell, he was humiliated, was humbled. And that's when his conversion came. And you know, uh, 
this is my this is how i just want us to imagine it i remember i was listening to a particular minister speaking about something similar and he says that he just imagines peter sitting with the disciples in a fire maybe the i don't know maybe eating some some fish whatever it be that they're doing that fire and then they just start peter what what happened to you that day anyways I mean, man, you just cursed and you swore and you denied the Lord. What was, I mean, we don't understand what happened to you. If Peter was not converted, you know what he would have said? He would have said, you know, this is the problem, John. People just can't leave me alone. You know, do you know that just like how now you can't leave me alone? Do you know that on that same day, if that maid, if that woman had not pressed me and said, you know, I'm one of the disciples, I would have been perfectly fine. I was not going to fall. But now the problem was that made. Are you with me? But you know, saints, Peter didn't say any of those things. You, find, you don't find such a record in inspiration. But Peter was humbled. He took the fault. He said, Lord, it is me. I am at fault. The Bible said Peter. The Bible says that Peter went and he wept bitterly. Not weeping because the maid did this to him. Mm -mm. Because he has done this to the Lord. Are you with me? Peter now saw that the real problem is Peter. Not the people who are making the mistakes. Not the ministers who are making mistakes or falling or this and that. And not the, the people who are causing you know, me to fall or whatever it be. The problem is me. And Jesus says that that is conversion. He says when you are converted now strengthen your brethren. Strengthen your brethren. Do you see that saints? How that the offense came to help Peter. So even us likewise, sometimes as we see the faults of people that we trust, ministers, ministers, yes, even ministers of present truth. As we see some of their faults, sometimes it is to reveal to us how much we had placed confidence in man. We have placed confidence where confidence ought not to be placed. How much our own hearts did not have a firm grip upon Jesus, but truly the grip was upon man, and as man is seemingly sliding away, we are so, so touched and offended because what is sliding away is what we have placed our confidence upon. It is the rock on which we have been anchored. Are you with me? And for such people the offense is necessary not to kill us not to make us fall but to teach us are you with me saints to deal with the fault before the final test comes before it is irreparable are you with me saints we are told that in his mercy and great faithfulness hmm? god permits these offenses god permits these offenses notice again an interesting scenario in the old testament come with me now uh, to the book of Kings. Mm -mm, not Kings, Chronicles. Many of us will remember Hezekiah. Mm. Do you know, as I'm just thinking about Hezekiah, something is coming to mind again, saints. I, you know, the Lord is putting this so, so much in my mind and all of these things, you can just see even the examples, saints. Like I'll tell you, the Lord has just been pressing this upon my mind because this will surely happen even now before the crisis where many people many people let me say many ministers to whom people have looked up uh, many might make mistakes many will make mistakes are you with me as history is prone to repeat itself many will make mistakes and if you don't understand these things if we don't understand this what we are learning now we are going to be offended we are going to be at angry at Jesus for the fault of a man. Are you with me? Can you just imagine that? Let's say you have been busy serving the Lord, doing the preparations that you need to do for the crisis and for his second coming, and all of a sudden, some minister makes a mistake. And then because of that minister, you just stop everything and you give yourself to the world. Ha! Ah, was it Jesus who made that mistake? Was it Jesus who has disappointed you? Why then are you disappointing Jesus and crucifying him afresh and putting him to an open shame. Because truly that is what many people do. 
a minister makes a fault, then Jesus suffers for it. Saints, no. No, 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 no. The reason why we are disappointed, some, many times it is because of our expectations. We have thought of man more than what is written, as Paul says. But if we think of man just in accordance with what is written, then we shall be safe. What is written again? Let's remind ourselves. Psalms 39 verse 5. Verily every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Now notice, saints, another thing that happened, an offense and a mistake that was made by Hezekiah. And notice what was the purpose of that mistake. When Hezekiah had been healed from his disease, if you will remember now the history, uh, God showed it to him even by a miracle where the sun moved back. You remember? And as the Babylonians, the Chaldeans were prone to study the stars and the sun, they saw this and they came to inquire. And uh, Hezekiah was supposed to glorify God as they came to inquire. But Hezekiah, the Bible tells us, let maybe, let's just pick it up in verse 36. Uh, I mean, not verse 36, verse 25. Verse 25 says, But Hezekiah rendered not again according to the benefit done unto him, for his heart was lifted up. Therefore there was a wrath upon him and upon Judah and Jerusalem. Hmm? It says, Notwithstanding, Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, both he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord came not upon him in the days of Hezekiah. Are you with me? So Hezekiah lifted himself up. He did not reveal to the people the God of Israel who had done all of these marvelous things, but he just continued to reveal things about himself. He showed the riches, all the riches that he had acquired. Are you with me? So he did not do what he was supposed to do and he lifted himself up. Now notice the reason for this. Verse 31 says, How be it in the business of the, of the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who sent unto him to inquire of the wonder that was done in the land, God left him to try him, that he might know all that was in his heart. Are you with me, saints? We are told that the reason why these ambassadors came and Hezekiah was permitted to act as he acted. Are you with me? We are told that God left him to try him, that he might see what is in his own heart. It was not for God to see what is in the heart of Hezekiah. Obviously, God knows all hearts. Are you with me? But it was so that Hezekiah might see what is in his own heart. And we are told the result uh, in verse 26, that Hezekiah, after having seen the pride of his own heart, he humbled himself. Are you with me, saints? Do you know that when you read in the Bible, we are told that Hezekiah is the most righteous king Israel has ever seen. Do you know that? It mentions him together with David and sometimes Josiah as well. But Hezekiah is mentioned twice in the Old Testament as the most righteous king that Israel has ever seen, Hezekiah. And truly when you study his life, saints, this is the only time you find a mistake in his life. His life was amazing, truly. It was amazing, amazing, amazing. Yet even someone whose life was so amazing made a mistake. Are you with me? And we're told that he made the mistake so that his own faults might be revealed to him. Hmm? And sometimes God also permits us to make mistakes so that our own faults might be revealed to us and saints to be offended at the faults and the mistakes of others. It is a mistake as well. For or, 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 We are also making a mistake by doing that. And when we're making that mistake, God is revealing certain things about ourselves. Are you with me? There are many things that we learn. Sometimes we can even become very upset to a point where we cherish resentment towards the minister or the ministers. Are you with me? And God, by these experiences, he's showing us, do you see, my child, that there is resentment in your heart? Do you see that the same love that is throbbing in my own heart as God that I have for sinners. When you see someone sinning or making a mistake, you are 
angered rather than by rather than being moved with pity and desiring for them to be helped to be to be saved from this madness that they are in are you with me and many of us you know i, I remember i saw a video saying like recently circulating uh where people in our church they were dancing and doing all of these things like they're worshiping Baal. When you read the account where Baal was worshipped and you see that video, you will think it's the same thing, speaking about the same thing. Truly says, and you know, sure, I was very much, yeah, I mean, I was very much sad and ah, my heart just sank. My heart just sank. And you know, the first impulse that comes to the heart, it's anger. You, you become angry, but how can they do this? But as I meditated upon the issue more and more, and I looked at it again in the video, and my heart was just stirred with sympathy. They said these people, many of them, they don't know the truth for this time. Many of them are fast asleep. Many of them need to be warned. Like, you know, maybe some of them, maybe some pastors, they, they know and they are just grossly negligent. It is true, it can happen, yes. And I'm not saying let us entertain negligence. Are you with me? But I'm saying things is that the first impulse should be to have pity upon the sinner, to desire for them to receive help and salvation rather than anger. If ever our hearts are knit together with the heart of Christ in this work of soul saving. Are you with me? So that is it, saints. The offenses are for our help. Now I'm just going to show you a wonderful quotation uh, that shows that every trial, saints, that we face is for our own benefit. Oh, I love this quotation. You might have seen it before because I just really love showing it. Minister of Healing, page 471. Says the potter takes the clay and molds it according to his will. Who is the potter now? It is God. Says the potter takes the clay and molds it according to his will. He kneads it and works it. He tears it apart, presses it together. He works it then dries it. He lets it lie for a while without touching it. When it is perfectly pliable, he continues the work of making it a vessel. Let me pause here. We are told that this is how the potter is dealing with the clay. He takes it. He needs it. When he's needing it, he's, 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 he's almost punching it. Are you with me? Imagine yourself now as the, play, uh, as the clay. So you are receiving some punches. Hmm? So some difficulties. We are told that he then tears it apart. Are you with me, saints? He presses it together. He wets it. He dries it. He lets it lie for a while without touching it. Are you with me? Sometimes you might even get the feeling, oh, God has forsaken me. And he's just letting you lie for a while without touching you. Hmm? Now, let me ask you, according to the quotation, look at the quotation. What is the reason, according to the verse? I mean, according to the quotation, it says... When the clay is perfectly pliable, hmm, he continues the work of making it a vessel. So we're told that the reason why God permits many of these afflictions, offenses, temptations, whatever it be, to come upon us, it is to make us perfectly pliable. Do you know what it means to be pliable? To be pliable means to be moldable, to be shaped into whatever shape the potter wants to make you. Are you with me? And... When we're perfectly playable, then God continues the work of making us what he wants us to be. Many of us, we're still very stiff. We want our ways, we want our own things. And God is in the business before making us and molding us. He needs to make us playable. And that process of being made playable, saints, it is a painful one at times. It's a painful one. But if we understand that this process is for our own benefit, all saints, you can bear the pain. Because you know that the one who is holding you, the potter who is holding you as the clay, is one who has died for you. The same hands that are molding you, pressing you, these hands are scarred. These hands are scarred so that you might have life. Are you with me? And when you know that, saints, you know that mm -mm, I'm being pressed and molded so that I can be made a vessel. Are you with me? A beautiful vessel. This is not happening to kill me, but to give me life. Are you with me, saints? So God is permitting all of these things for our own help. And this is the thing I want to show. Last quotation in your closing. 
in many of these circumstances what really really proves our destruction is self is self we pity ourselves too much we think of things relative to ourselves too much rather than relative to christ and the plan of salvation you know very few people when they are offended by seeing someone doing something very few people th sit down and think yo how can such a person do this to jesus and then they kneel and they bow and say, Lord, I'm so sorry that such a thing has been done to you. Please, Lord, may you help me to just see what I can do, you know, to help these people who are doing this. Very few people, many people, they just look at things relative to themselves. I mean, how can they do this to us? I mean, we, we are church members. I mean, how can, how, how can they dance like this? You know, this is supposed to be... And we are just angry. Also, I, I mean, saints, you know, I was feeling like that. How can they be dancing like this? What if now other people in other places are here, are going to see this video and we're busy doing evangelism? And then people see such videos and then they're just filled with so much anger. Nothing you are thinking about Jesus. You're just thinking about self. Think about self, 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 self. But I told you, self is the enemy we most need to fear. No form of vice has a more baleful effect upon the character than has human passion not under the control of the Holy Spirit. No other victory we can gain will be so precious as the victory gained over self. Are you with me, saints? So this is it, saints. This is it. So how God prepares us for the shaking that is coming without a doubt, it is by allowing us to see some faults in some people now. And also some faults in us. So that as the faults come out, they can be dealt with. Whether it is the fault of trusting in man, making flesh our arm. Whether it is the fault of appetite, the fault of anger, the fault of grudging. Are you with me, saints? Whatever fault it be, God has a thousand circumstances to make sure that it comes out so that you can deal with it. Many of us, sometimes we look at ourselves and we think we're faultless. And for such a person, it must needs be that offenses come. Let us pray, saints. And as we are about to pray, I will invite you to just look at this picture. Look at the Son of God, clothed in that robe of mockery and infinite humiliation. This is the man that has died for us, saints. Look at how he was set at naught. Pilate pointing at him as if he is nothing, saying, what shall I do with this one? Do you know that this is the king of the universe who is treated in this manner, who is wearing the crown of thorns? You know, since there are thorns here, we stay in the country. When a thorn pokes you, one thorn pokes you. Something poked me yesterday, even while I was just, you know, praying. Something poked me and, you know, you know I bled and it was painful. Imagine the thorns on the forehead around the entire head, saints. The pain that Jesus took for us. The love that heaven has shown towards our saints by this pain. It is amazing. All of these saints is saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. I want you to be where I am. Don't allow anything to distract you. Come to me. Don't allow man. Don't allow even your own faults to distract you. Come to me. Are you with me? Oh, saints, let us, let us pray and ask the Lord for help. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we bow before your holy throne at this time. We really, really thank you for the study that we have had and just for showing us, Heavenly Father, the folly and the foolishness of trusting in man and making flesh our arm. We thank you for this preparation, Lord, preparing us for the crisis that is coming and we are told that it's going to hit many of us as an overwhelming surprise. And we have just studied now, Heavenly Father, that one of the greatest surprises that we are going to find is the class and the caliber of people are going to be falling away. And we are told that because of that, many are going to be falling away as well. I am praying, Heavenly Father, that H, Lord, might really reach many people lord with the study and yeah even though lord my mouth you know i'm a child and i make mistakes even in my speech 
I pray, Heavenly Father, that you may speak directly to your children. I pray that to all who are watching, Lord, you may really, really implant a firm determination in their heart to not look to men, to not to look to men, Lord, and to just to look to you and to make you their confidence and their strength. Please, Heavenly Father, we love you so much. We thank you and we ask everything in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I will behold thy face in righteousness, I shall be saved.